Coming up, we pay tribute to one of the most underappreciated singer-songwriters of the rock era. Uh, this legend that was a co-singer in one of the biggest bands ever. Uh, since he passed away, he really hasn't gotten the praise or recognition that he so richly deserved. Even though he wrote or co-wrote some of the most significant songs of the times, standards, the modern standards for sure. Coming up next, we celebrate him in his first solo hit with his frequent co-writer and friend. Stories coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure that you subscribe below to be a part of this community that is dedicated to the all-time classics of music. You get it straight from the legends. And if you want even more videos and to go behind the scenes, we have a Patreon link below that you can check out. So I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists go very deep into their greatest songs and albums. It's one of my favorite shows we do on here. I think it's one of our most popular as far as stats go. On this installment of Revelations, we're gonna pay tribute to someone who truly deserved better, when he passed especially. It's one of the most important singer-songwriters who came of age in the 70s. Uh, Eagles co-front man, the late Glenn Fry, uh, Through his co-writing partner and good friend, Jack Temption, who's going to tell us about this, he wrote several Eagles classics, including Peaceful, Easy Feeling and Already Gone. We had him on the show a couple uh, months ago, and he's just a great storyteller. Now, uh, Eagles formed in early 1971 when Linda Ronstadt and her manager at that time, John Boylan, they recruited Glenn Fry and Don Henley for her band. While on that tour, they decided to form their own band. Legendary standards like Take It Easy, Lion Eyes, Desperado, Hotel California, and so many more would follow. But by the, the beginning of the 1980s, the band had begun to splinter and they eventually broke up. Naturally, the two principals of the group launched their solo careers. You know, Don Henley released I Can't Stand Still with the, the top five hit, Dirty Laundry. Dirty Laundry. And Motor City's Glenn Fry dropped the album No Fun Allowed. It was a bit earlier that same year. This would be the first of five solo records by Glenn Fry. Like I said, I've always felt that Glenn Fry is sorely, sorely underappreciated. You know, Don Henley was always the critic's darling, um, as well as he should be. I mean, he's incredible, one of the greatest ever. But Glenn is up there as well. I think that people don't give him enough credit. He could play just about every instrument, and he had a very distinct voice. You know, one of the most recognizable baritones of the rock era. Every now and again, I like to do videos on Glenn through his music, and today we're going to talk about his first major solo breakthrough song. It's one of my favorites, remember as a kid, The One You Love, written with Jack Temption. Going back to the one you love. This song peaked at number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100, and it went to number 2 on the AC charts, also went to number 12 in Canada. I love how Glenn interprets this song vocally, and the inspiration behind it, uh, which we'll hear uh, straight from Jack, uh, from the night that Glenn and Jack wrote this hidden classic, and insight from Jack on what made Glenn Fry so special as an artist, as a songwriter, as his friend. Now, before we begin, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I wear exclusively. If you want to add some style to your life, go design your own pair at the link below. You just put in your prescription, and voila, you're, you're there. Here is Jack Temption on the great Glenn Fry. Well, first of all, I loved the Eagles and being a small, tiny part of them by writing a few songs that they did, and a kind of and a huge fan. And I was never, you know, I wasn't involved in the breakup, or I wasn't around. I was doing my own thing, and so it's not that I liked it when they broke up at all. And through the whole fourteen years. I was kind of always encouraging Glenn to maybe, you know, put them back together. They worked really hard on some of those albums and kind of blew themselves out. Uh, but he called me and said, Jack, I'm, I, I'm, I, need, I want to write some songs. You want to come over? So I came over and uh, he was living in the Hollywood Hills in this A-frame place he was renting, one big room, and it had belonged to James Cagney. And I walked in, I could feel the vibe of some Hollywood parties. Uh, and Glenn had uh, about a hundred candles burning, 
in the place. And then he had two bottles of red wine, uh, each one costing more than my car. Uh, you know, and I go, Glenn, what? Uh, I said, I don't drink wine. He goes, this is songwriter wine, man. You got to have some of this. So I go, okay. <laughs> and uh, I go, well, what's with all the candles? Do you have a date later? You know? <laughs> and uh, he goes, no, man, it's the muse. You know, Jack, she's up there. And, uh, you know, we're not the only guys trying to write a song tonight. And we want to set the scene so she comes down and hangs out with us. And, you know, so I got That's awesome. Yeah, I'd be I'm going, oh, okay, yeah. I, I didn't even know about that. What have I been doing all this time, you know? <laughs> we were always, uh, we always had so much fun together, Glenn and I. And even a few years before he died, I sat there thinking about all the times I'd known him for 40-some years, you know, and just like, I thought, man, we, we never had any friction. We always had just a tremendous time. So that first night, we wrote a couple things. We wrote, I found somebody. He played a Johnny Horton record or something, and we kind of got a groove. And then uh, I think we wrote the one you love. Need a friend, someone you can talk to. So we wrote a couple of hits that first night. Well, the one you love, ah, oh, that's yeah. my favorite song by Glenn. Ah. Um, it's just such a great, it's one of those songs that has truly stood the test of time. I love the saxophone. Yeah, and, uh, that went to number 15 on the Hot 100, number two on the AC charts. But that tenor sax, Ernie Watts, and then later on, it's obviously uh, Jim Horn. Tell me about that song, what you remember about that, because what a, just a scorcher. I was looking at a book called uh, Baker's Jazz Guitar, a jazz guitar book. And it opens up, the first page of the book is about 20 chords that you're going to learn to do the jazz guitar. So like... I'd been doing it for weeks and I, I hadn't even gotten through all 20 chords, you know, they're really like, uh, <laughs> and so I had written something, I'd written a song to just so I could try to learn the chords and I'm trying to learn these chords. Later I talked to my friend, Greg Lease, uh, the guitar player in the Funky Kings. And he said, yeah, I, I looked at that book too. And I never got through that first page either, you know, and he's Greg Lease one of best guitar players in the world. He played with Eric Clapton's band. He, he's now playing with Jackson Brown. He's played on everybody's records. And so I'm going, okay. So I came over to Glenn's and I showed him these chords. And uh, being Glenn, he just went, oh, okay, boop, boop, boop. And he had them instantly. And then he's like grooving on these chords. Maybe the, the muse is going to come down. And there's two of us guys. And she, what if she had to choose? between two really cool guys, you know? <laughs> and that's what the song's about, this girl having to choose. Uh, we were trying to make up something, and I, I said, are you going to stay with the one you love, uh, with the one who loves you, or are you going back to the one you love? Are you going back to the one you love? And he goes, Jack, that's wow. You know, uh, he loved that. And so we built the song around that. And then, of course, I think we produced it, uh, we might have used the Lynn 9000. Some of the stuff we did was just Glenn in my little house in Hollywood bopping out the drum part, because the Lynn 9000 was the first drum machine that you could you could sequence other instruments in there, you know, like a drum and a bass, and, uh, and Glenn would just do it all, because he heard it all in his head. He heard the hit record completely in his head and already knew, and then he would hum the sax and folk part to the sax player. And it would just, I would just kind of be watching it all come together. And, and a lot of times we didn't, I think we might have used the drum machine. You know, I, we just used what he put down and he would play a couple chords on the piano and it was just amazing. Where did that saxophone line come from? Do you remember? Is it something that he started kind of humming in his head? Because I know he played all the instruments really on that song, except for the saxophones. Yes. 
And so I think we probably we sequenced them at my in my in the bedroom of my little house. Uh, but I know when the sax player came over, basically Glenn hummed the part to him. He already had the part in his hand. Glenn had the part in his hand. Yeah. Wow. That's why they called him uh, the Lone Ranger <laughs> in the Eagles. They called him the Lone Ranger because he could just, uh, he heard it all in his head. And it was just there. And so then uh, the Eagles were not together for a period of 14 years. And uh, those were amazing years for me. You know, it's like, I loved Glenn and we got together and we were great friends for all this time, long before the Eagles. And to just have this guy that, that you like, and I didn't know how great Glenn was at first. I, I heard him with J.D. Souther and we jam and stuff, but I just thought he was a folky guy like me because we were just playing guitar and making stuff up, you know. But I didn't realize that he'd been in bands all his life. I didn't even know he played bass and I didn't know that he knew all about singing harmony and I didn't know, I just didn't see the scope of who he was. And plus there was a lot of other things. Uh, he, he was a, a team captain. He could pick the best players and put them together. He put the Eagles together with much thought and he could motivate and, and, uh, and plan. And, you know, he had all these, uh, so to just have your buddy turn out to be one of the best writers that ever was, and you just get to like work with them, pretty much a dream come true. And we wrote together for 14 years. Yeah, I want to ask you about some of those songs uh, for sure, because they're classics. <laughs> so cool that I never heard that before that you, so when the news come down, what does she had to choose? Because that's what's great about this song is that it really is about the one you love. It's the, she still loves her ex-boyfriend developing a close relationship, but then the ex calls. I love that like second verse when he says, I heard you on the phone. I heard you on the phone. You took his number, said you weren't alone, but you call him soon. Isn't he the guy, the guy who left you crying? Isn't he the one who made you blue? Isn't he the one who made you blue? And then the chorus is, of course, the line that you would come up with that you loved. Going back to the one you love. That's what's great about the song is you can feel that yin and yang and that, that, that angst, the feeling that the person is having of this other woman having to choose and everything. And you get the feeling maybe this ex-boyfriend is not so great, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but she's like still, uh, women often don't fall for the right guy. And then Glenn had an unbelievable way of expressing the woman's point of view, like in lying eyes. He could somehow just get there and, and say it like better than anybody, you know. So the thing about that is so disappointing that was just heartbreaking to me is that when Glenn passed on, it was right at that moment that like Prince had passed away and David Bowie before that, and and it got lost. And I thought this is one of the greatest songwriters and singers ever. I mean, the biggest band of all time in America certainly just looking at the numbers and I just feel like kind of, same kind of thing happened when Dan Fogelberg died. I just really disappointed. They should have made a bigger deal about his legacy because to me, again, it was flashy. I get it. I love Prince. I love David Bowie. They were the stylists, right? Mm -hmm. But Glenn Fry wrote so many standards. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I just, that was one thing that really disappointed me. I felt like that he should have been honored more. Well, from the uh, years that I worked with him, I'm finding like I, I mean, I did an album uh, last year. Uh, it's on Mail, Mailboat Records, Jimmy Buffett's label. 
and the title song is One More Time with Feeling. So that's a song I wrote with Glenn. There's songs I wrote with Glenn that we didn't we didn't ever record, and so nobody's heard them. And so I'm doing them. I mean, uh, you know, it's not it's not like having Glenn do them, but but even so, there's a song uh, called "Peace of Mind," and he actually did a demo of it with him singing it and stuff too. So there's songs still, and I feel I've the world has to hear those two. Yes. You know, uh, but yeah, I think over time, and he did make that Eagles movie. To get better as songwriters and as performers. I think they were very ambitious, particularly Glenn. When I saw the movie, I thought, well, I know everything he does is great, but it didn't occur to me that that would be a great, great movie. And I think because he picked the director and the guy said, well, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. Glenn said, no, don't. Just tell it like it is. You know, and uh, so that's a, a tribute to him in a way. And, and I'm sure as time goes on, people will recognize and remember. Thank you for watching. To get more of this interview and many others, you can click on our Patreon link below. Um, make sure to leave us a comment about Glenn and Jack and... And this great song from the, the 80s, it's just uh, it's one of those songs that always came on, uh, you know, the clock radio, you know, when your power would go out and, and then, you know, the power would come back on. It always seemed like this was a song that was playing. Anyway, until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. See you soon.